Welcome to section 16.3 and section 16.6. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to round back and talk about some of the sections that we skipped when we were covering chapter 16. This is going to be on solid state chemistry. Now, what you guys are going to notice is I'm not going to do every single little subtopic in each one of these sections, and I'm going to jump from section to section. So please make sure that you guys watch these videos and understand which topics I am going to cover and which topics you are responsible for. When we go ahead and talk about solids, we're going to talk about two major classifications, whether a solid is crystalline or amorphous. Now you've heard me say the word crystalline before, so let's delve into that definition a little bit more in depth. When I say something is crystalline, what I'm saying is the atoms or molecules are arranged very orderly all throughout the solid that it is making. And so when I make a solid material, what I'm looking for is highly ordered structures throughout the entirety of the material. Now you guys can take a look at the structure as a representative. What you guys will see is that you can see that these yellow spheres right here, these are all arranged in almost a hexagon. In between each of the hexagons is my red atom. And you guys could see that that hexagon pattern repeats over and over and over again. If you look at each one of these bonds, you'll notice that each yellow thing is surrounded by three red things, and each red thing is surrounded by two yellow things. Now, an amorphous solid is something that has short range order. When I start looking at the structure throughout that solid material, what I see are inconsistencies. Now, you can take a look at this picture of an amorphous solid. What you guys see is I don't see the same type of rings. Some rings are made out of only four yellows. Some are made out of six. Some are made out of more than six. But what you guys will notice is there are some certain things that are maintained. My yellow is still surrounded by three red things, and my red is still surrounded by two yellow things. What I have is short range order, but when I look throughout the solid, it starts to break down. It, to tell if a solid is crystalline or not, we're going to use X-ray diffraction. Now, X-ray diffraction is a very powerful technique used to describe how a solid is put together. The idea here is that X-ray crystallography is going to use something called Bragg diffraction. Let's go ahead and see what happens when we expose something to X-ray light. Here's the scenario that I want to describe for you guys. I'm going to have a solid material, and at the surface of my solid material are going to be the atoms that comprise that solid material. There's also going to be a second layer of atoms right underneath that surface layer right here. Now, what's going to happen is I'm going to go ahead and shine x-rays on the solid material. So that's going to be my incident x-rays. So what I want you guys to recall from Chem 1A is that X-rays have the wavelength that is about the size of a nucleus. And so what that means is they are able to pass through the spaces between atoms. And what's going to happen is they will reflect only off the nucleus of an atom. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and shine my X-rays. And so that wave's going to progress forward and it's going to hit a surface atom. Now, when it hits that surface atom, it's going to go ahead and get reflected out. Now, what can happen is I can shine a whole bunch of x-rays, and let's take a look at the second x-ray right here. Now, this second x-ray, it doesn't hit the surface. It actually penetrates through, and it hits an atom on the second layer. Once it hits that atom on the second layer, then it's going to go ahead and be reflected out. So to simplify my picture, I'm going to have X-ray 1 and X-ray 2 hit my solid material. And they are going to come out as X-ray 1 and X-ray 2. Now what's going to happen is that these two waves are going to interfere with each other. Now one way that they can interfere with each other is constructively. 
And that means whenever my wave peaks, my other wave is going to peak. So all my peaks match up. And so what happens is that these two x-rays are going to combine and they're going to make a bigger x-ray in amplitude. Another thing that can happen is when the x-rays come out, they can be completely out of phase, meaning when one peaks, the other is troughing. And so what's going to happen is these waves are going to destructively interfere, meaning when these two waves come together, I'm going to have them cancel each other out. And so what occurs is when I go ahead and shine x-rays onto a crystal or a solid material, what I can get out is either an enhanced wave or nothing at all. And so here's a piece of x-ray photography. And what you guys will see is all the bright spots on here. Well, that's where my waves were interacting constructively. And all these dark spots that I have, well, that's when the waves were interacting destructively. Now, based on this picture, what I can see is I will be able to tell the spacing of my atoms. And so this is what Bragg diffraction tells us. It tells us an equation in which those x-rays will come out enhance. So this is the equation that I will give you where n is going to be any integer. So that means it could be 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Lambda is going to be the wavelength of my x-rays then D is going to be the space between the two atoms that I have in my crystal structure. Theta is going to be the angle at which I go ahead and shine my x-ray beams at. So the practical use of this equation is if I keep changing the angle of my x-rays, I will be able to figure out how far apart those atoms are distanced from each other. Now, once I do that, I can tell if my atoms are evenly spaced out and if I have long range order or just, or just short range order. So when people actually do crystallography, they take a solid material and they spin it 360 degrees and then they shine an X-ray beam onto that solid crystal. So the sections of chapter 16 that I didn't talk about in the past have to do with solids. So let's go ahead and take a brief look at some of the types of solids that we can have. Now, most of these solids are going to be described by the intra and intramolecular forces. And so these will tell you the types of solids that we are describing. The first solid is something that we've constantly been talking about and that is ionic solids. Ionic solids are going to be made from a cation and an anion. So these are things that are charged species. Now these are held together by electrostatic forces, basically saying I have a plus, I have a minus, I go ahead and put them together. So something that I want to emphasize from Chem 1A and to remind you guys, NaCl is an empirical formula. When you go into the lab and you grab some NaCl, there is nothing in that bottle where there's a single sodium attached to a single chlorine. In fact, those salt crystals, what is going to happen is you're going to have a sodium that's surrounded by chlorine atoms all around, and those chlorines are surrounded by sodium atoms. And so NaCl is the empirical formula that crystal is made out of trillions upon trillions and trillions of atoms put together. Because they are put together through electrostatic forces and forming ionic bonds, these bonds are really strong. And so all these sodiums and chlorides that are all jumbled up together, well, they are stuck together pretty strongly. And thus, these ionic solids have high melting point. The forces keeping it together are super tough to overcome. 
Now, because I have this regular pattern of positives and negatives alternating, there happens to be a lot of order in these salt crystals, and they tend to be very brittle. And that's because I can't mush them around or have them slosh around or bend because I want to have that regular positive, negative, positive, negative throughout the crystal. The next one I want to talk about are molecular solids. So remember, what I can do is I can have high enough intermolecular forces, and if my intermolecular forces are high enough, my molecules are going to stick together and create a solid. So molecular solids usually have high intermolecular forces. So one example is water. To get water to become a solid, you have to go under low temperatures, but at the end of the day, you can arrange these things together. Note, because molecular solids are put together through intermolecular forces, which are much weaker than the ionic bonds that we just talked about, they have lower boiling points than those ionic species. Next, what I can have, or I can have are atomic solids. And that means I have one atom placed in my solid material. Now, this is different from what we just talked about. For example, we can have things where it is one atom and they bond together through intermolecular forces. But what I'm showing you here is when those atoms actually form covalent bonds with each other. So a classic example of this is going to be carbon. If you look at the structure of diamond, what you will have is carbon, and that carbon is bonded to four other carbons. Now, each one of these four carbons, well, they're bound to four other carbons. So you can think of a crystal of diamond possibly be one ginormous molecule put together through carbon bonds where each carbon is bonded to another carbon. Now, you guys might have remembered from Chem 1B that carbon forms aleotropes. An aleotrope means that I have the same atom, but I get different types of solid material formed. And the reason that I get different types of solid material formed is that they are bonding together in a different fashion. So we talked about diamond. Let's go ahead and look at, at graphite. So in graphite, instead of having sp3 carbons, in graphite, what I'm going to have are sp2 carbons. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all my carbons and put them together in these hexagons or these ring-like structure that look very similar to benzene. Now what I can do is I can make sheets of these sp2 carbons in this hexagon arrangement. Now what you guys will see is that I can have these sheets which are made out of covalent bonds and I can get multiple sheets stacked upon each other. And when I have these multiple sheets stacked together, well, these are put together using intermolecular forces. And so that's why graphite melts at a lower temperature than diamond, and it has different properties. Graphite is actually a very good lubricant, and the reason is, is because I can slide one of these sheets of carbon past another sheet of carbon. And so that's why it's important to talk about aleotropes, because once we get a different crystallization or a different arrangement, we'll get different properties out of our solid. The last type of solid I want to talk about are metallic solids. Metallic solids are a special type of atomic solids. They are made from metals off the periodic table. Now, what you guys can remember is that metals like to give up electrons. And so the way that metals form bonds with other metals is you're going to have the nucleus of the metal. And what happens is the electrons of the metal are kind of smeared all over the place. And so what you guys can think of is that there is a sea of electrons. There is no physical locking of bonds where the electrons are localized between things. They're kind of sloshing back and forth. Now, because the electrons are in this kind of sea of electrons, 
This is what makes the metals malleable and electrically conductive. One way to envision conductivity is you can think of putting an electron on one side and taking an electron out on the other side. Now, if you have a sea of electrons, this is very easy to do because it doesn't matter how many electrons are in that C because there's a ginormous amount of electrons. So putting one in and taking one out doesn't really affect one particular atom because it's dispersed through many atoms and they are able to compensate either an extra electron or missing an electron. And also because I don't have localized bonds, that means I can go ahead and bend my solid without breaking any kind of interactions. Well, I hope that made sense, Chem1C, and remember to stay safe.